Hi everybody, welcome to this next video from the Wisconsin First Detector Network. Today we're joined by Susan Carpenter from the UW-Madison Arboretum, and she'll be telling us a bit about using native plants in our gardens. Thanks. This talk I'm titled Landscapes Filled with Life because I'm going to talk about native plants and about how they benefit us and benefit our landscapes. So I'll be sharing a little bit about non-native plants and how you can use native plants to replace them. But just think about landscapes filled with life. So within each region, wherever we live, if we're in a southern area of the state or northern area of the state, we know that the weather, climate, and so on are a little bit different. The soils are different. The, the um, vegetation is different. But there's always native plants that are available that you can use in your landscape. And so just a few things about native plants. They are the basis of all food webs. So when we think about a rich food web with lots of different species involved, native plants are at the, at the beginning of that food web. They represent themselves, of course, a great deal of biodiversity, and then they support the biodiversity in, in, a, in a region. They perform ecological functions. So for example, pollination uh, wouldn't happen without native plants, and that has a that has a very important role. Also, there are some other roles that I'll talk about later, such as a water infiltration into soil that native plants can mediate. When you're using native plants, you can allow for reduced inputs of some of the things that gardeners typically think of when they're gardening. So we don't use fertilizers, we don't use pesticides, we hardly ever have to water our native plants and we don't have mowing as you would with uh, say turf grass or something that takes more mechanical maintenance. And the main thing, one of the main things that they, that native plants will help us with is they help us learn more and connect with and conserve and restore the land. So the places that we live can be as healthy as places that we perhaps just visit. So some examples for the home landscaping uh, we, we see in these four pictures the uh, different, some different features. We see four rich or flower rich areas that are planted. When you can tell in all of these pictures, there's a great diversity of plants growing. And these are all designed gardens, but they're, they're also very naturalistic as well. So we have gardens for every kind of site and every kind of uh, soil type, every kind of soil moisture type, every kind of slope and aspect. So no matter where you are, you can match um, up to that. These represent a uh, shorter prairie vegetation, tall grass prairie vegetation at the upper right, uh, an edge habitat with semi-shaded area at the lower left, and a short grass area. Sometimes people are looking for native plants that are not quite so tall. So a short grass area with um, scattered forbs can be used in that setting, shown at the lower right. When we think of plants, we think of all the different kinds of plants. And so we can start with trees as the biggest plants. And so uh, this is an oak. This is a burr oak, which is one of our classic Wisconsin oaks. And it obviously is uh, attractive to <laughs> to uh, squirrels and chipmunks. As you can see, it has a huge acorn there. But hidden away a little bit, uh, a little bit more, a little bit harder to see, is that it is that oaks are also the host for very many butterfly and moth species. Uh, so oaks are hosting over 500 species of butterflies and moths. And that is in contrast to the non-native trees, some of the common horticultural trees that are used in landscaping or that you might plant in your yard that don't really host uh, any or maybe just a handful of insect species. And those insect species hosted on oaks or on many of, other, of our other native trees are essential to the health and the well-being of the native birds. So again, we're in this idea of the food chain and the interconnected uh, levels of life in your garden or in your landscape, and a, the amount of caterpillars that a chickadee needs to feed just even a small bird like a chickadee that needs 5,000 caterpillars to feed the nestlings from one of its clutches. So if there aren't the native trees there to support the native 
insects, the native birds can't survive and can't raise their young. I will give some examples of some substitutions that can be made. So some common trees, uh, or a common tree that's used in landscaping is the Norway maple. And it looks a lot superficially like a sugar maple or one of our other native maples, but it is not. You can learn how to distinguish it very, fairly easily from the way that the fruit looks. So the substitute species for that, a, nat a couple of native species that would work in place of Norway maple, would be red maple or black gum, if you have a site where you can grow that species. Shrubs are a well-known form for some of our most well-known invasive uh, species like buckthorn and honeysuckle, but one I'm going to feature right now is the Japanese barberry. And this is a plant which was is grown horticulturally and has uh, naturalized into wooded areas, especially uh, the barberry does especially well in sandy soils on slopes. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter if it's north facing, south facing, it's just the t soil type that it really does well in and it's in the in wooded areas. So it substitutes for Japanese barberry, which is commonly used in horticulture, are New Jersey tea, or the dwarf bush honeysuckle, which is an, a wonderful native honeysuckle um, that you can grow in, and both of those can grow in pretty much any kind of uh, soil. Another species that's invasive and, and still actually planted in some places is multiflora rose, and that one can be substituted uh, by native roses or prairie rose uh, as an example. I've got this slide up now showing you one of our uh, native mints this is the dotted mint at the left there, and you can see there is three different pollinators there, the black wasp at the top and a bumblebee and another different kind of wasp toward the bottom. And this is a plant that is, it's a Monarda species like bee balm, but it's a little bit uh, different in terms of its site preferences. It grows in a little bit drier sites, and it also doesn't spread quite as readily as the bee balm does you can see that it's uh, very attractive to pollinators of different groups. So for flowers, you may want to substitute uh, native mints and you may want to learn what their, what their growing form is and how they behave, so to speak, in the garden uh, so that you can match up the right mint to your, um, to your situation. A lot of people find the mints to grow throughout their garden and that's kind of a problem. <laughs> But uh, this one's very well behaved and very interesting to grow. I did want to mention the grass over here. We have a giant, another giant wasp. That's the golden digger wasp. These are, these are wasps that are kind of scary looking, but they're solitary wasps. So they don't really, they're not aggressive or anything to people. This golden digger wasp is taking a katydid. She's got the katydid up on a big blue stem and she's getting a better grip on it before she flies across the prairie to uh, put it into a hole in the ground and to lay her eggs on it. That's going to be the food for her larvae as they develop. Um, so we actually got to see her flying across the prairie carrying that Katie did. Getting back to the grasses, she's on a big blue stem and big blue stem and Indian grass and switchgrass are some large, dramatic native grasses that I would really recommend to use instead of grasses like miscanthus, the Japanese silver grass, or some of these other ornamental grasses that you see around um, the landscape. Those do spread and naturalize, and the native grasses, uh, while they will spread, will not take over other grasslands or other areas. And then ground covers. Uh, with ground covers, we have a lot of, well, there are a lot of ornamental ground covers because people like to have uh, something covering the ground instead of weeds. But for ground covers, we can use native plants instead of some of the common ornamental ones. A couple of examples of ornamental ground covers are bishop's weed, um, squill is a little spring flower that uh, is very, very common. And those plants can be substituted with natives, such as the wild ginger, ferns, 
small sedges of many different species of sedges that will work in this situation. If you have a drier site with little more sun, you can use the Canada Mayflower, which spreads as a ground cover as well. And another great way to use an area that's kind of wet or that can be modified where you have drainage coming down is to use a rain garden uh, vegetation. And you can see from this picture, this was one of our rain gardens very early in its development and it has quite a variety of plants, quite a variety of forms and you can tell that there are that there are plants that are blooming at different times. So the brownish looking plant at the right is the angelica which is long past bloom time. Those stalks are dying back now but they're releasing their seeds and then we have the swamp milkweed, the bone set, there's some mountain mint, um, there's turtle head and other plants that you can't quite uh, see in this picture exactly, but this is a, a place that's blooming over time. And the rain gardens, uh, the native plants have deep root systems, and those deep root systems are going down into the soil and they're able to create channels as they grow and allow water to infiltrate. So those deep root systems are serving a role that turf grass or some other kind of shallow rooted plant that might be growing in this area can't really perform. And the kind of habitat, of course, we all know the story of monarch butterflies using milkweed as their larval food. Um, maybe something that is not thought of quite as much is that the monarch is not as effective at, at pollinating milkweed. So we do have bumblebees mainly, and uh, so, to some extent other bees, pollinating milkweed. And you can see on this picture of the golden northern bumblebee some golden structures on its legs and on its mandible there. And those are the little pollinia from the milkweed that bee has pulled out from a visit when it was uh, not on purpose, but it was visiting the flower for nectar, and those pulled off on the little hooks on its legs. And now when it returns to the milkweed, those will be able to be inserted into a little slot on the flower, and then the seed pods will be produced. Other plants and other pollinators, of course, I'm, I'm not talking really about the kind of cover that these gardens provide for other animals, but some of the pollinators, again, uh, we have hummingbirds, of course, and uh, bumblebees and the different flower forms and the different flower colors will attract different pollinators to this um, garden. And then later as the seeds develop, different bird species are usually using the seeds as food resource. So we want to maximize the number and diversity of native plants in the landscape. This is an early spring photo, so it shows you a glimpse of what a forested garden could look like then. This is just one snapshot in time. At different times of year, it will look different and your native garden always will have that kind of dynamic change in it. And you want to be able to plant a seasonal succession, have plants that are blooming at all different times within that same landscape. So we have midsummer at the right, more mid to late summer at the top of that rain garden there and then more of a fall look there at the picture at the lower left. I do encourage you to plant straight species. There are a lot of native plants that you will find and sometimes these are at the nurseries, more the commercial nurseries, and they are cultivars of the native species. And we find in some cases that the the plant does not have the same wildlife value if it's a cultivar compared to the straight species. So this was just an example here of a cultivar, non-native cultivar of um, Baptisia at the left and the native Baptisia all that at the right. Uh, these are the same bee, the same species of bee <laughs> visiting and both of them have been collecting pollen. We can see that from their carrying pollen. but whether or not these are uh, providing the same value is something that you can evaluate to some extent by watching plants in your own garden. So if you try something and uh, if you try growing something and you notice that nothing's using it, my advice usually then is I've only got a certain amount of space. So if, if a plant isn't really attracting any life or functioning in any way, an ecological way, I usually would like to replace it with something that does. 
And so part of learning about this is that there's so much that we don't know. So I would just encourage you to document and photograph and share what you learn. Uh, this, these pictures are part of our bumblebee document, uh, our bu bumblebee monitoring project, and these are both bumblebees. The rusty patch bumblebee, of course, is in a, a federally uh, endangered species now. This one in the lower picture here is the yellow bumblebee in Wisconsin. That is a declining species now, and it is a state species of greatest conservation need. For bumblebees, there are projects for you to share your photos and become part of a larger project for monitoring bumblebees both in Wisconsin and elsewhere. And finally, there's lots of lawns and lawns normally uh, the way many people maintain them are pretty sterile places. One of the most sterile places that you could find. A lot of chemical inputs, a lot of mowing inputs, often watering inputs, and we kind of turn that on its head. This is an example of a lawn that was left unmowed for a few weeks, mainly because the, pers the person who was mowing noticed that there were a lot of bees there. And when she told me about it, I went to take pictures of all the insects I could find. So I just went around with my camera and photographed and found eight species of bumblebees, including the rusty patched, six species of butterflies. There were moths, wasps, several kinds of solitary bees and dozens of honeybees. And they were just visiting the red clover, the white clover, the heel all that was in the lawn, another type of plant, and also, strangely, the little plantain flowers as well. They were gathering pollen from that. So uh, you can leave clover in your lawn and have, actually have it serve as a resource if you don't want to convert your lawn to other native plantings. Clover, obviously, is not a native plant, but there are some native plants and some ornamentals that do serve some ecological roles. So especially, we've kn I know I've mentioned a lot about pollination, but there are some ornamentals and some weeds that will serve those roles. And you can just, uh, it, the more we can learn about this, the better. And so be sure you're sharing what you notice and what you do. These are references that I thought would be helpful for you. Of course, Talamy's book is a classic about some of the ecological roles of native plants. The, uh, the next three are books that help you with specific species. They are organized either by plant form or by season, and it's the kind of examples that I gave earlier. You could look up a certain type of non-native plant that you have in your landscaping, and you could find other alternatives that are natives. And so they're really useful books and they're covering trees, shrubs, and everything and everything on down to the smallest plants. The Wisconsin DNR has also um, some resources for native plants for landscaping and they also have at the very bottom there you'll see the native plant nursery list. When you're purchasing plants you'll often be getting small plants like this uh, flat over here at the right. Make sure that your plants are not treated with systemic insecticides before you purchase them. Those insecticides stay within the plant tissue as the plant grows and so we want to make sure that we're using plants that are not treated ahead of time. And sometimes you have to ask and check. Most of the native plant nurseries won't do that, but you can always check just to be sure. Well, thank you, and I hope that I can answer some questions from you, Anne. Thank you, Susan. I think this is a really nice, informative talk that hopefully is giving some of our gardening crowd some ideas for their own gardens and yards. This is a really great list of resources. I'd like to also mention that the Midwest Invasive Plant Network has a smartphone application called Landscape Alternatives that also uh, suggests some native alternatives for some of our commonly planted invasive plants. So if you like to carry this information around on your smartphone, that's one way to do it. You were just talking about asking questions at nurseries. So obviously we, we have lists of native plant nurseries and that's maybe a good first step for people to take if they're looking for native plants. But if they're not near a native plant nursery or even if they do visit one, what are some other questions that people could ask at the nursery to make sure that they're getting native plants that are gonna be high quality additions to their gardens? Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is the regional match if you want to stick with that. And of course, you know, some people are more strict, if you will, about native plants for exactly their region. But the, the 
main point of it is that if you use plants that are native to your region and they're well matched to your site, they're really probably going to be successful. If you're trying to do something, you know, just like any gardening, if you plant a plant in the wrong place and it's the wrong plant, then you'll, you won't have success. So I think an important question to ask nurseries, first of all, some of the commercial nurseries are moving more into carrying native plants, but they might be carrying cultivars. So you might want to ask about that if it's a cultivar. There is a literature now building on, say, how pollinators are using, you know, the co different cultivars are evaluated, like based on pollinator use, for example. So you can get that information ahead of time if you have the species in mind. Another way to approach it, and it's really not too hard, is to use seeds use native seeds. So we have native plant nurseries that provide seeds and a lot of times they'll have a mix. So it'll be a mix for dry soil, a sunny spot, or you know, just different like filters like that that you can get a good you know, mi match for your site. You want to pay attention in that case to some of the preparation of the site because if you're planting plants into an area, they're going to grow, you know, just you'll be able to see them and know where they are. In some cases when you're seeding, you want to do a little more site prep to the area to make sure that you um, have it ready, um, preparation being a large part of the job. And then to keep in mind that some of the plants, if you plant the seeds, let's say in the spring, they'll germinate that year. And others will need to go through a cold, wet treatment like next winter in order to germinate. So they'll be breaking dormancy perhaps at different times. and so patients or another thing that we've done sometimes is to take the seed mix in the fall and put it out like get a flat like this one that's pictured with soil in it and or even just a just a flat by itself and put soil in it and then sprinkle the seed on it and then cover it with a screen or something so it doesn't get dug up and leave it outside like mulch it leave it outside over the winter and then when you come in the spring those seeds those seeds will be germinating and you'll begin to recognize maybe what some of those seedlings look like and kind of match those up because there's some really great resources for looking at what the seedlings look like of all the different like prairie species and so on. So that, that can be a good, a good resource as well. I imagine that uh, some people who are maybe newer to the idea of planting native plants might be looking at their gardens or since it's April right now, they might be thinking about what their gardens look like during the growing season and realize that they potentially have a lot of non-native plants and they want to replace them. Mm -hmm. And then I imagine that these people might get really overwhelmed and think, oh yeah. my gosh, I have so much to do. So do you have any tips for people to kind of, who are just getting started with this? Yeah, uh, in terms of, sure. you know, how can you tackle this really large project yeah. or just do a little bit at a time? Yeah, I think you probably do want to approach it kind of with a, a almost an experimental mindset in a way or trial and error would be another way of putting that. But you don't have to do everything at once. There's no, there's no real reason for that. I would say if I were just giving someone advice from, you know, just a basic yard, I would, first I'd look at it and I would see, well, how many species do I have here and what are they? And what am I, you know, like with the lawn, am I, what am I, you know, what inputs am I having to do to this to maintain it the way it is? And do I have any tolerance for it being a little bit different, like with clover in it or some other flowering species? So I would look at the yard to see what it, what it has now. And then I would think about what are one or two changes I could make. So one thing people might want to do if they like the idea of having another tree is to plant an oak tree. And everybody always says that the best time to plant an oak tree was 25 years ago. But this bur oak that I mentioned before, we planted them about 15 years ago, and they were about six feet tall. And now they're three times that tall. They're huge trees. They're really doing well. So you can plant an oak any time is a good time to plant an oak tree if you can. And then you might look at some of your other, like some of your shrubs or foundation plantings. Do you have barberry growing there? Do you have, you know, do you have Sometimes buckthorn is planted as an ornamental. Do you have species like that, which are not only not serving a wildlife role in your yard, but they're also providing seeds and fruits that are being scattered other places and so kind of becoming invasive as with your, possibly with your yard as kind of a source. So those I would recommend 
eliminating pretty quickly. And then when, once you, if you take out a shrub, you've got a flower bed. And so you can either, if it's still sunny, if it's sunnier now in that area, you can do plants that are with more sun. Around houses, it's often uh, neat to use savanna species because savanna species do well in light shade or even in full sun, but they usually do well in kind of an intermediate light situation. So sometimes even in the shadow, kind of the shadow part of your house, which might be to the north or to the east, there might be an area where there's not really a tree providing shade, but it's still kind of shaded because of the building itself. So savanna species can be very useful around houses because they have a wide, uh, most of them have a pretty wide amplitude of light levels that they can thrive in. And then there's clay, a lot of clay soil for a lot of our gardeners have a lot of clay soil. So there are species that are better suited for cl heavier clay soils. And those you can find out most of the native plant nurseries would have basically an information sheet within that has all the species and shows their characteristics of soil moisture and light requirements so you can kind of go through there and figure out what would work best for your situation but you know starting with like a little flower bed or just replacing a few things or if you usually plant annuals maybe plant some these are all perennials so plant some of these and see how they do and and then they may spread a little bit or you may want to collect seed from them and keep and keep building along with it you'll find out which ones you're you know if you're if the rabbits are around and they like certain things better than others or you have deer around um, but I do find you can you can fence things off a little bit with deer in our gardens here when we plant new things they love to come and nibble on those pull some of them up sometimes when we've just planted them but after a while, once the garden has developed and it's a little taller, they don't um, really bother it anymore. So we, we don't do anything in terms of fencing and all, but in your own yard, you might want to put a little fence around to protect a few plants that you're, you know, until they get established, until you find out who's eating what. <laughs> great, those sound like a lot of really great suggestions. And I appreciate that you mentioned things like the barberries and buckthorns in our yards spreading seeds out into natural areas. Um, I hear from a lot of gardeners like, oh, well, I didn't know this was an invasive plant. It's not doing anything in my yard. And so right. I think it's important to think about, well, what is the impact of our gardening spaces on the wider world and particularly when we live close to natural areas? Yeah, and even in, you know, when we think about even even within the city, we have green spaces and areas between, you know, where there's maybe drainage and that kind of stormwater drainage and that kind of thing. And so once it's established, once the plant's established there, then that area becomes a source and it just kind of keeps going. You know, and invasive species usually have a, a rapid growth rate and, you know, really effective means of, prop, of propagating themselves. And we, you know, we are in a position to handle that in our own in our own yards and also in all the kinds of projects that people are participating in with maintaining other land and doing other land management so besides learning and um, sharing and documenting I'm not just suggesting doing that for your own purposes although that's awesome <laughs> but sharing is really important because you know what someone learns is going to you know is going to matter for lots of people and for the whole community of people that are doing this kind of work. Thank you. It's yeah. really been fun to think about this. And Great. Glad thanks to so, be here. Thanks so much for joining us, Susan. And for those of you that live in the Madison area or have the opportunity to visit, there <laughs> are native plant garden tours through the growing season at the Arboretum here in Madison, and you can check the website for those dates. Thank you for watching this video from the Wisconsin First Detector Network. To learn more about our network or to access additional information about invasive species in Wisconsin, please visit our website or contact us.